good afternoon and welcome to the Simons Electron Microscopy Center's Winter Being course. We have just completed our tomography section and now we're starting our super particle section. We're honored to have Dr. Joachim Frank here lead us off. He's, we've actually had this in course with you for 13 years and he's been involved in a lot of that and he's been a very uh, welcome addition to, to be a part of our education outreach programs. And uh, let's see, I think a lot of you already know his bio, but I'll just briefly touch upon it. Uh, he is a National Academy of Science member in 2014. He received the Benjamin Franklin Medal of Life Science. In 2017, he received the Wiley Prize, and as well in 2017, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. I would have to say that we don't have too many textbooks for the course, but I would say if you're in the field of single particle analysis, this is one book that you probably should get and read through. Uh, a lot of early single particle reconstruction of, of algorithms and uh, mathematics have been worked out by Joachim. Actually, the first programs I was using for single particle analysis was SPIDER, which he quite championed when he was at the Waldorf Institute in Albany. And I think he was an early adopter of a lot of these maximum likelihood algorithms, especially the Bayesian statistics, and moving on to now interesting things with manifolds. Okay, without further ado, Joachim Frank. Thank you. So I just um, <clears throat> wanted to tell you how we can get uh, solution structures of, of molecules, a single particle. Uh, it's called single particle reconstruction, not, not cryo-EM, because uh, initially all these algorithms were developed uh, completely without cryo. Uh, cryo sort of merged later, later on. Uh, okay, so I, I, I think um, You've already got some of the concepts in, in earlier lectures, so there might be some overlap. I'm, uh, I apologize. I just didn't know what already happened. Um, so uh, the imaging and transmission electron microscope uh, means that we get uh, you know, parallel projections. These are line integrals uh, to the object. And uh, this, so it's unique to transmission. Transmission means that the image is formed by electrons that go all the way through, uh, as opposed to uh, scanning, um, uh <coughs> you know, backscattering kind of microscopes. Uh, and uh, and then you you're probably already familiar with this um, uh, theorem. Uh, we can get from dimensional projections to a two-dimensional uh, structure by using a, a well-known Fourier theorem. And this is depicted here uh, with an object. Um, what the theorem says is that um, <coughs> there's a way of getting from a two-dimensional structure by just using a simple distance to the three-dimensional structure of the object. The idea is by collecting more and more projections from space, uh, the theory says more and more would uh, would reflect reflection. And uh, and then there is obviously there is some some kind of need for interpolation that we know the theory would would kind of say. Um, so th this doesn't mean necessarily that we have to go to this only shows you conceptually that uh, there's a mathematical way of, of getting this. So there could be all kinds of shortcuts, including algorithms that take place in real space. <coughs> and the first of such reconstructions was done in 1968 by Aaron Klug and D David Derosier. They were both at uh, MRC. You have to appreciate that this was the ever the, the first three D reconstruction ever with uh, using a computer. There was nothing uh, done before. The principle, uh, like what 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 I showed you before, this is the central section theorem, 
it was only worked out of 1917 by uh, by Radon, and then of course there had been no way of using it until uh, computer signals were available. Uh, so, um, but it's interesting that this first application was with um, a bacteriophage theory, uh, which is an object with very high symmetry. It has helical symmetry, which means that a single snapshot is already enough <coughs> to provide all the information. Um, so, uh, <coughs> The, um, here, in another application, the existence of symmetries and, and high order uh, provides computation shortcuts. We can uh, get a, the reconstruction much more easily than in the, in the more general case. So incidentally, there was also the belief at the time that uh, uh, highly ordered objects were absolutely necessary in order to even define the structure. Uh, there was even uh, the whole concept of, of a structure of a single molecule that was not in some kind of regular packing was, uh, was, not, uh, was really uh, not entertained. <coughs> um, and, and, and this, this uh, just shows the, the generally different geometries that we use in order to collect images. <coughs> this is the, the one in CAT scanning uh, where we have a, a patient stationary and we have an X-ray source and detector arrangement that goes around in regular increments until we get uh, this entire um, <coughs> angular space filled. And you can see this electron tomography is, is exactly the same. Uh, it's only the, the order, it, <coughs> the arrangement is different. Here you have a, a stationary electron beam detector arrangement. And the, the molecule or, or tissue or whatever is tilted around in increments. So it's exactly the same. Mathematical principles are, uh, are the same. And uh, what's also the same is, is the build up of, of, of a dose, uh, x ray dose here, electron dose there. So, because it's the same object being exposed over and over again. And the, the whole idea about the single particle reconstruction is, is to make use of the fact that uh, molecules exist in thousands and millions and trillions of copies. Uh, that are virtually identical in structure. So, so that uh, an active tilting through so many angles is not necessary. The molecules tilt themselves. They are simply randomly oriented. So a single snapshot uh, of, of an entire field of, of molecules is sufficient to collect uh, a whole bunch of uh, projections in, in random directions. And, <coughs> and if, <coughs> if the angular coverage is not, not sufficient, then you keep, you, you just keep collecting um, more images and uh, so gradually the entire uh, angular space is filled. So that's, that's the principle. Um, <coughs> so I already told you, uh, the reason why single party data collection is so much superior is, uh, is radiation damage. Um, and, <coughs> you know, when you impinge with energy, of <coughs> with, with radiation of any en energy uh, on, the, uh, on the atom, then we get uh, ionization events and uh, we get free radicals and so forth. Now, there is a difference between different kinds of scattering events. One is elastic scattering. In that case, no energy is transferred. It's, it's almost like a billiard ball, which sort of, <coughs> uh, when it's hit, it sort of contracts a little bit, and then it bounces back. And, uh, <coughs> and there is no um, energy transferred. So the energy is temporarily stored and then immediately released. Uh, in elastic scattering, uh, all the events that lead to ionization 
bond breaking, formation of radicals. So while low temperature, there's a double purpose uh, the present, uh, to pres present molecules in close to native environment uh, and in a high vacuum to the beam. So the electrons are traveling, they ha have to travel in vacuum. And if you, if you expose uh, molecules in their native environment in, in a liquid to vacuum, then uh, you know, everything blows up and, uh, <clears throat> and you get uh, a breakdown of the vacuum and the molecule is not being served in this. Uh, and also to trap the damaged molecules and keep radicals from migrating, causing further, further damage. So radiation damage is sort of a very complex event because the molecule is being damaged um, locally or, and, uh, and in the process, uh, free radicals form and if you, if you keep the free radicals in place, then the damage is really not big. But if the free, free radicals can, can migrate, or they can, because of their chemical properties, they are very dangerous, and they can damage other molecules. <coughs> so, so that's why um, a going to low temperature has, um, has these benefits. Um, <coughs> So uh, essentially, uh, in an electron microscope, we, um, <coughs> we have magnetic lenses, and um, the sample has to be very thin, because otherwise we get a lot of inelastic scattering. Um, so the, the typical sample thickness is um, a point 0.25 microns, it shouldn't be above that. Uh, and uh, typically, uh, when we talk about the single particle techniques, uh, we, we're talking about um, a 1,000 angstroms, or 0.1 micron. Um, so <coughs> in general, large scattering ang angles are associated with high resolution, small scattering angles with low resolution. Now the inelastic scattering is is always low resolution. It's sort of sort of <coughs> uh, confined in a in a very small pencil. Um, now I just wanted to uh, tell you something about uh, <coughs> uh, wave aberrations. That's with this. Um, is there any pointer here? Anybody has it? No. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so I have to march around here. Uh, yeah. Um, <coughs> okay, a perfect lens um, <coughs> takes uh, rays that emerge from a single point and then produces one single point here in the uh, in the focal uh, the back focal plane. Um, an imperfect lens um, has essentially, you can think of it as having different refractive indices uh, as you go along. So when, when, you, when you go to large apertures or large angles, then uh, the focal length becomes different. Um, in electron microscopy, the focal length uh, for rays that intersect the lens at, at, at high angles uh, is shorter. Uh, and uh, this is expressed by a spherical aberration co coefficient, which, which is negative. Okay. Um, so <coughs> which, which means that if you, if you look at all the rays that are intersecting here, then you can you know, essentially define a place of least <coughs> Uh, of least confusion, uh, where you, you get sort of the <coughs> the smallest uh, the smallest disk, but you never get a point. Okay, root aberrations uh, always mean that you don't get an ideal uh, <coughs> image. So I, I'm I'm going to explain this uh, later on with the concept of the point spread function. Okay. <coughs> 
and then and then it it's it's um, sort of intuitive uh, that damage affects small features first and then larger features. So if you continue exposing, um, then uh, then you will first see that uh, you know tiny little things change and then more and more gross features uh, get. Uh, get affected. Oh, this is great. I love this blast. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm, I'm just going to go a little three, bit through specimen preparation. Again, I don't know whether you've already gone through this. Uh, we, we've been talking about, um, we're talking about purified sample. Uh, and, and the idea the whole idea of single particle imaging is, is that you have molecules that are exactly the same. And then from that point of view, you need incredibly high purity. So the demands on biochemistry are very high. Uh, but the standards of purity have changed with, with the invention of, of powerful classification methods. So we can now live with heterogeneity. We, could, we can even have different uh, different kinds of molecules in the same sample uh, if it's not too many. You know, if it's too many, then each class becomes very small and then you don't, you don't get anything out of your data collection. Um, and then, uh, obviously, uh, there's, a, there's a great advantage in being able to um, image molecules in, in, in different states. So it, it becomes uh, especially powerful if you have molecular machines and, and you have some kind of a process going and you, you, you see all the different states of the process at the same time. And this is a unique advantage of electron microscopy compared to X-ray crystallography. Okay, so typically we have an, uh, a sample uh, on an EM grid at a thousand angstrom suspended over holes um, and careful control blotting is a is a critical step um, there are these commercial blotters uh, vitro bots and so forth which uh, can control um, the force and, and the time computationally uh, and the coverage with molecules is determined by um, sample concentration, geometry, and makeup of the metal grid. Um, copper grids have been uniformly used a long time ago, you know, and, and then um, there's a disadvantage of copper because it, it sort of contracts um, a, in a, a differentially, so it contracts more than, than, uh, than the carbon. And uh, so it be, th that means that the carbon becomes warped. And then people have u been using molybdenum grids, uh, which has a different kind of uh, thermal uh, expansion coefficient. And then lately, gold was used. Um, and I just have, a, have something that shows you uh, the advantage of gold in a moment. Um, so here is, uh, <coughs> is, the, is the whole principle. Of, um, <coughs> uh, of such a punch freezer. Uh, <coughs> so you have sort of a, a, a rod, tweezers, a grid, and, and then a, <coughs> a droplet of the specimen is put on the grid, or the axis is plotted away, and then, and then this uh, steel rod is released, and the grid goes into liquid ethane or propane on liquid nitrogen temperature. Why is it not directly plunged into liquid nitrogen? Does anybody know? Thermal conductivity is too low. Pardon? Thermal conductivity is too low. Yeah, uh, that's uh, exactly right. A and it's not the liquid nitrogen that is the trouble. It's the, it's the gaseous. It's the, it's the bubbles that form when when the specimen enter. So you you essentially you get. Uh, <coughs> A, the, the specimen uh, falls into liquid nitrogen, and immediately on the interface, uh, there is the formation of, of um, nitrogen bubbles. And they 
prevent the efficient transfer of heat. Uh, and since it's, uh, the transfer of heat is so low, um, is so slow, uh, you get the formation of crystalline ice. And that's the deadly thing that you want to avoid. Okay? Um, and that, so, so, so this whole breakthrough for which um, Jacques de Boucher got his share of price is, is the introduction of this little thing here in, inside of the liquid nitrogen. Um, so it's, it's, uh, <coughs> the ethane is on the same temperature as the liquid nitrogen. Uh, and, and, and so if, you, if the grid uh, goes into it, we don't have any bubbles. And uh, the, <coughs> the heat transfer is instantaneous. And what they, uh, in 1980 or 81, they uh, found that the uh, <coughs> consistency of, uh, of the water uh, in, in, this, in this frozen state is, is vitreous. It is like glass-like. Uh, and it, it, it's uh, as, though, as though the water doesn't even notice that it's being frozen. And the molecule, uh, that's the important part, is not being crushed in the process. <coughs> this is a manual device that one can build for a few hundred dollars. This is a device here which costs probably 60,000 or something like this. They're visual boards. Uh, they're computer controlled, they're environmentally controlled um, <coughs> because. Uh, the critical thing is that after, after you blot here, uh, then it depends on the, on the atmosphere, uh, on, the, on, the, on the temperature, humidity, uh, how, uh, what, how, much, how much of the, of the layer is left by the time this plot is done. Okay. So you, you have, you have an, sort of an, an element of, of uh, <coughs> You know, you have a lack of control uh, unless you have a <coughs> climatized chamber. Um, so the specimen support um, used to be homemade. Uh, there was some kind of a recipe uh, for doing this. Now, nowadays, people um, buy contour or C flat grids, and they have the uh, have these holes in regular order. Uh, and that, that is convenience for uh, automated uh, data collection. Um, and uh, now this here uh, gives you an idea of, of how much space uh, there is. Here's the EM grid, and then each square is like this, and it has is perforated with holes, and each hole in itself has enough space to have you know, two or three micrographs. So when you when you look when you look at such a hole, uh, then uh, there can be all kinds of effects that uh, that prevent the the molecules from spreading out uniformly. And one one is uh, the this kind of meniscus effect uh, that leads to a thicker uh, liquid uh, here at the, at the periphery and thinner uh, in, <coughs> at the, uh, in the center. Um, so that depending on what kind of molecule you have and what kind of thickness you start out with, and maybe also the properties of, of the metal here uh, have, a <coughs> have an effect, uh, you can get something like this uh, meniscus effect all the molecules go to the uh, to the periphery, and there is nothing here in the center. That uh, that can happen. <coughs> um, and here is a, is a little bit more of an of a uh, <coughs> of a scheme here. Uh, we have a copper grid here, a quantifoil, and uh, we might we might have a, an, an optimal. Uh, optional uh, thin carbon film here, which is sometimes good. Uh, for instance, for for is very good uh, to uh, to get um, 
a more random orientation. Other uh, noise is not so good. So it is that you can imagine that you have you have this uh, vitreous ice layer of a, around a thousand angstroms, and the molecules are sitting uh, not not at, at random points here, but they are prefer preferably sitting at at what the bottom or the top. And it's just been found here, here at the end, where, as you see, at the, <coughs> the center, there was a very interesting study where people have done tomography to see exactly where the molecules are. And it was found that uh, they prefer preferably be out on top or at the bottom, and hardly anything in between. Uh, gold grids. Uh, they were introduced a few years ago by John Russo and Laurie Passmore, um, and they discovered that the that the entire uh, 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 grid sort of goes up and down like a drum uh, under under the electron beam. And this is an an, an effect of the charging. Um, and uh, and since there is a sideways component, uh, you you do get. Uh, and, and, and substantial reduction of uh, of resolution. And the gold grids um, were shown to reduce the effect uh, by <coughs> by a factor of fifty. Uh, so here, these are uh, <coughs> these are typical curves that you get with with carbon. And down here is the line for gold, which is the line is in gold. Okay. Uh, this is the fact of uh, 50, very inventive. So <coughs> 50, 50 fold reduction uh, in the in the z dimension. Um, okay, so now uh, just to put it all in one slide, um, single really means we're not looking at one molecule, but rather single as as the signals in the bar. Okay. Uh, not attached to others, okay. uh, unattached, <coughs> uh, and uh, and that affects really everything uh, in sample preparation and and processing and, and so forth. Uh, why single particles? So the, one of the most important uh, advantages is that you have a native conformation. It's unaffected by crystal packing. Okay, crystal packing means that um, you have a whole bunch of molecules and they all sort of congregate and, and associate and they seek uh, an energy minimum um, in the association. That can be associated with, um, with um, some, some of the components uh, assuming a, a particular configuration that uh, might have nothing to do uh, with the with the one that the molecule assumes when it's functioning, okay. So um, <coughs> so it means that with cryo EM functioning meaning of little states can be visualized. Very often in an X-ray, uh, if it doesn't if it doesn't form a crystal, then certain parts are chopped off. Okay. Um, <coughs> the idea is uh, at least part of the molecule can be get uh, gotten at, at very high resolution, and, and so uh, they, something has to be sacrificed. And then uh, you mentioned multiple states can be visualized from the same sample. Uh, and so it's very um, advantageous uh, for looking at the dynamics of a molecule. Um, and a disadvantage up to 2012, was uh, the uh, computation challenges were very large, atomic resolution difficult to achieve, and this was all gone. Uh, computational challenges are, st are still large, but now we have GPUs, uh, we have specialized code that is already hardwired, and uh, so so this is no longer a problem either. Uh, okay. So the main assumptions are all particles in the specimen have approximately identical structure 
and all are linked by 3D rigid body transformations, rotations, translations, which means that uh, <coughs> it, it governs the way different projections are related to each other. They are related by conceptually by uh, changing, uh, by, by rotating the molecule as a rigid body. It doesn't allow any deformations. Um, and the particle images are interpreted as a signal, uh, which is the projection of the structure that they have in common, plus noise. So uh, very often an additive assumption is, is used, uh, even though it's, it's not exactly true. Um, and th there's an important requirement that we have even angular coverage. Even doesn't mean evenly spaced. But, but uh, sort of generally even uh, without allowing major big gaps. <coughs> so here's an, um, here's an example of global coverage. Uh, you see that there's a lot of um, congestions here at the, at the poles. But in general, uh, there's, there's something everywhere. There's no, no major gaps. Here, uh, this is an interesting case um, where there are major gaps, very huge gaps. However, it is, uh, it is still uh, uh, acceptable in a, uh, in a sense that it, that it is a coverage that is like tomography. Okay? It is as if, as if you had a particle and then tilted it around a single axis. Now, unfortunately, this kind of coverage, even though it, it could potentially give you the complete information, is, is really not, not good. It's not acceptable. Because all the algorithms that are, have been developed, uh, they were all developed for, for this kind of geometry. Okay? So chances are that if you, if you use this kind of coverage with these other algorithms, then uh, you're going you're gonna to get artifacts. OK, there's an <coughs> there are very nice displays that you might have seen already that gives you um, uh, a mapping of the number of particles in the different directions. Uh, there's some kind of a color coding. Um, OK, so uh, just, just to. Uh, in order to get a concept of the geometry, this would be a carbon grid, okay? Or the, the entire diameter is, is three millimeters. And this would be just one grid square. And the grid square now is, is in turn covered with these little holes. And one hole looks like this. And that is now covered, and you, now you can see the molecules. Okay, and then you have to think, you have to figure that in the liquid phase, the molecules, you know, are doing all kinds of movements, conformational movements, and then uh, you get from there, you get sort of a frozen state in, in just in one single snapshot. And then with a the computer, uh, <coughs> you, you get, um, you excise the, the different particle images, that you know, all kinds of particle picking algorithms. And then in the end, you have a gallery uh, with which you have now to proceed to uh, 3D reconstruction. This here is, is a real micrograph of eukaryotic ribosome. Uh, with these fantastic new cameras, direct detection cameras, you can see uh, how strong the, the contrast is. And then um, uh, the next step then is that you one determines the uh, orientations with 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 program, and and performs a three D reconstruction. And that of course that would assume that they're all uh, they're all the same. And they're not, so there has to be a classification step in between um, that now sorts out. For instance, in the case that I, sh I showed, you have the, the two subunits rotate against each other and, 
at the very least, you want to sort out the ones in which it, which is rotated one way and from the ones that are rotated the other way. <coughs> and then, just as an as a, in, in parenthesis, single particle methods um, essentially have taken over uh, already a long time ago uh, from from the other methods because because ordered assemblies. Are, are never they, they don't ever have the perfect order that is required in order to get the highest resolution out of them. Uh, but rather, uh, <coughs> what one can do is is one can take sections out of an out of this entire assembly, and then uh, find find the precise uh, position of of each of these patches in these in in the in the total. Uh, assembly uh, by cross correlation techniques. So these uh, techniques sort of have invaded uh, the Fourier techniques uh, already a long time ago that happened in helical uh, order, uh, 2D crystalline order, and icosahedral order. So the general principle is uh, to <coughs> use the symmetry to roughly locate the repeats and then the refined position by using the cross-correlation function. So this second step is exactly the same as in single particle. Okay, so now I'm, I, I just, I'm, I'm going through a number of concepts that, um, that are very useful to, to know. The, the, the problem that we have now in cryo-EM is, is that there are uh, these black boxes of programs uh, that don't tell you what what actually is going on, um, and it, and so it's dif difficult to 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 visualize uh, what what kind of problems are being solved uh, inside. Uh, so there used to be a time when um, when modular uh, image processing systems were used. Uh, Spider was one that I de uh, developed a long time ago. There were other um, modular systems. Modular <coughs> program systems, the, the, the idea is that you have, you have modules. Each of these modules is, is doing a certain task and doing it properly. And uh, <coughs> you know, Fourier transform, autocorrelation, cross-correlation, shift, rotate and, and so forth. You have these modules and you can put these modules together by, by invoking them with commands. So in other words, you, you write a script. Um, it, it, it's a kind of programming that doesn't, uh, that doesn't require knowing uh, the exact code, but, it, but it, 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 the, each operation is sort of has has a certain conceptual meaning, so you can, um, uh, with these kinds of programs, you can put uh, an entire edifice together, um, and uh, an, an entire workflow, um, a, and and experiment with it, uh, and you can also you can, just, um, show, uh, and instruct yourself you know, what certain operations are actually doing, what, what they accomplish. And, and all these capabilities are lost now. So um, I'm <coughs> sort of trying to revive the modular uh, systems and they, at least they are very uh, good uh, instructional tool. Okay, signal noise, definition of SNR. Uh, what is a signal? The signal is uh, predictable, deterministic, it originates from uh, from the object. Noise is stochastic, unrelated to the signal. Uh, it's aperiodic, and no two realizations are the same. The signal to noise ratio. Uh, the definition in in signal processing and image processing is always the ratio of the variances, the signal variance divided by the noise variance. <coughs> so
So averaging over n noisy realizations of a signal increases the signal to noise ratio by a factor of n. Right? So it's sort of an interesting thing that what is signal and what is noise in a given experiment depend on the way the experiment is designed and what you're interested in. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of this. Um, short noise is, is the noise that is produced by, um, by the fact that uh, you have very low dose, so, so the, the impact of electrons is, is completely statistical, and there is an, an <coughs> a, an, a variance associated with it. So, for instance, 10 electron per angstrom square, um, which is required to avoid radiation damage. Well, you know, meanwhile, larger doses are, are, are needed, are, are used, but ultimately, uh, we want to get down to that level in order to uh, retain the high resolution information. And then the fluctuations of the uh, distribution is a, is a very large a source of noise. Um, and low exposure images typically have a signal to noise ratio of, of 0.1, which means that the, the, vari the variance of the noise is 10 times la larger than the uh, variance of the image. <coughs> so I just want to talk about structural noise. Uh, I told you what is noise and what is signal, it depends on the, uh, on the kind of experiment that you, you want to do. Um, <clears throat> in this, the, the, the background structure um, of, the, of the carbon or of, of the ice is, is obviously a structure and a, as such is a signal. If, if, you were, if you were interested in exactly the, uh, this configuration here of structures along with this here, then we would say have all this is signal, okay? And there would be only the shock noise would be noise. However, the experiment that we want to do is to retrieve the structure of the molecules and not the, the structure of this here. So from, from that perspective, this is also noise, but we call it structural noise. Okay, so it's very important because we are we are not we are not just averaging over shock noise. We also average over that over that kind of noise because the realization of the carbon film here is is completely unrelated to the realization here, unless we have crystalline uh, carbon form. Okay, so. When we do two-dimensional processing, um, no, we, we, we're just talking about the projections themselves in the same plane, and uh, we can get noise-free realizations of these by averaging. And, but in order to average, we, we need to be sure that, that we, don't, we don't have apples and oranges. We need, we need to um, align the, the structure that is inside of the image. Uh, so there's translation, rotation, alignment, um, which is necessary so that the indices refer to the same content. Okay, that's very clear. You cannot simply average the molecules as they come in the, in the, in the random orientations and, and shifts, because otherwise when you average, you get a complete blur. So uh, averaging is, is necessary to improve the signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, and the averaging can be done in one of two ways. Make use of order or symmetries to locate the repeats, or make use of cross-correlation search to locate the repeats. Okay. Um, so if, <clears throat> if there is order or symmetries, then uh, then the 
<coughs> then there is a way of, of exactly locating each repeat um, because the symmetries uh, show up in the diffraction pattern and the Fourier transform and so forth. So it, you, you get all the information that allows you to exactly focus on where a unit is. And it's completely different for single particle because we don't, you don't know where it is. And you have to retrieve it, you have to find it, and uh, you have to get it in exactly the same orientation and translation as another one, as a reference structure. Okay, so here is an, here's an example of what happens in a, in a, uh, in a, in a crystal. Um, the, <coughs> the noise and the, uh, and the spill are, are completely intermixed here. And now uh, we can perform a two-dimensional Fourier transform. And then all of a sudden we see that um, the periodic information is, is concentrated in these reciprocal points. Uh, so these are points of reflections in Fourier space. And the noise is all over the place. So in other words, when we look at, at a point here, this is clearly coming from the signal. But overlaid, there is also noise, because the noise is spread out everywhere. But the noise is very weak here. Um, <coughs> and um, so what we can do now is uh, apply a mask, which has been done initially by optical uh, means, by using the little masks, or uh, by computational means. Uh, it means that um, you have an, a mask that has, <coughs> uh, that is an array with ones inside these little circles around the reflections and zeros outside. So you multiply the Fourier transform with this mask, and then you get uh, only, only reflections are left, and all this noise is completely taken out. So when you, when you do the back Fourier transform, you see the pure signal. Now there's a little noise left, because I told you Noise is spread out everywhere. It, 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 it even exists here in these points here. But, it, but it's a very small amount. So there's a little residual noise left. And if you do this, you get the amplitude and the phase of the Fourier transform. And um, <coughs> so in, in um, <coughs> uh, comparison with X-ray crystallography, uh, electron microscopes are, are uh, my mentor called them diffractometer that can, can that is uh, sensitive to phases as well. Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, in other words, electron microscopes can pr produce images. X-ray crystallography cannot produce images. It, it, it requires an, an extra amount of work in order to recover the faces. OK, so the second method uh, which we employ with the single particles is to make use of the cross-correlation search to locate repeats. Now here, uh, this was one of the first um, <coughs> Uh, exercises of this kind. Uh, this is a molecule of um, the 40S ribosomal subunit from HeLa cells. And he, uh, <coughs> the images had been picked and then rotated and, and shifted so that they all uh, are in the same uh, place in the image field. Which means that, that for <coughs> any, any index here always refers to the same uh, place in the molecule. 
this has been done by cross correlation. And um, when we average over a sufficiently large number, it was in the range of 100, uh, then we get this very clear uh, images for the first time that uh, I did in 1981. So you get an average. And in this case, a negative stain was used. Um, a negative stain is a way of preparing uh, molecules uh, with heavy metal salt, air drying, and then in, in each molecule then dries in a puddle of uh, stain, and, and the stain sort of laps up at the molecule and sustains it to some extent. I mean, there's a, there's a certain amount of collapse of the, of the molecule. Now, the interesting thing here is that um, since, the, since the stain, the lapping up of the stain is, is to different extents for each molecule, <coughs> when you compute the variance map, then you see um, that we have an, um, a shell of very high variance that goes around uh, the periphery of the molecule. Okay? So you can see uh, from, the, from this variance map, you can directly see uh, the variation in, in stain level. So I told you uh, cross-correlation is sort of the general tool that we use in order to do the alignment. Uh, and uh, this here is a, an un unnormalized version and a discrete version of the cross-correlation. What you have to do is, <coughs> um, let's say you have one image and another image, and you shift it um, in a certain position, and denoted by this um, difference vector RPQ, and then you form a uh, an average over this overlapped area, an average over the cross products. Uh, and the <coughs> uh, visualization of this is you can put the two micrographs on top of uh, each other, you know, let's say they are on film, you would put the films on top of each other uh, on a light box. And then you, 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 you sort of um, get a measure of, of the total throughput, how much light goes through. That is one single value. That's this value is determined uh, by this sum of cross products. And for, so for one particular position here of this shift vector, you get one reading only. So you, now you can you, you can do this for all possible shift vectors and, and and gradually fill fill up this matrix here. And <coughs> there's another kind of, of cross correlation with the rotational cro correlation, where you have a, <coughs> a defined um, origin of rotation or <coughs> center of rotation. You rotate the two. Or images against each other, and for each of the rotation, you form this cross product. So, in for the rotational, for this rotational cross correlation, you get one single um, profile. Okay, so it goes up and down. For the two-dimensional cross correlation, you get this two-dimensional matrix here. What does it tell you? Uh, <coughs> well, it's got a uh, if, if, if the same, ah, they have blast too much. <laughs> it's already gone. I mean, they never work. Okay, but we got the best out of it already. <coughs> um, so, a, if, if, if there's the same object uh, in these two images, then there's a particular position for which this um, superposition integral 
uh, becomes a maximum. What does it mean is, is that, that for a particular position here, we're going to see a peak. Okay. So, uh, in other words, the recipe now for, to comp computationally align uh, the, the two images is to compute the cross correlation and then uh, <coughs> obtain obtain this entire array of cross-correlation values, and then make a search through this entire array to look for the highest peak. That's what a computer has to do. Uh, look for the location of the highest peak, and see where this peak is situated compared to the origin. And that gives you the shift vector. This gives you the shift vector between the images. So in order to align the images, then you apply this shift vector the other way around. You, you, you shift one image um, in the opposite direction, and then you get perfect overlap. So that's what the principle of translational alignment is, or that's done completely automatically in the computer. Um, and I assume as uh, you've had already it's, uh, you've got an introduction in the Fourier transform before, so I'll just uh, I'll just pass this by, uh, <clears throat> and uh, okay. So we have a finite uh, series of two D exponentials. <clears throat> um, now it, it, it's sort of important uh, for for a later reference to to realize that the discrete Fourier representation of an image really means that what is represented is an infinite array of these images, all side by side. Um, why is this important? Well, if we, if, we, if we perform a shift here, then uh, we, we will realize that we, we sort of wander off into an overlap of, 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 this, uh, of this image on, on itself. Okay. So a, a shift of this here is not simply a shift here in, in, in the empty space, but rather it means that all of a sudden we have a different boundary that goes like this, like this, and like this. Okay. So it will become important in a, in a moment. <coughs> and uh, I'm, I'm using this kind of notation. Uh, this is an this is the index, um, two-dimensional index, two-dimensional Fourier transform, kx, ky. And, uh, and this is the operator of Fourier transforming, and it operates on the function f of r, which is f of x and y. Okay. Now, I always use lower case for the, for the real space and upper case for the Fourier transform. And these components, these are very clear in normal components in, in normal space, and these are the components of the spatial frequency. Okay, so now this is this is sort of an, a very interesting theorem uh, which is very useful in terms of thinking of, of, uh, of a problem. The Passivals theorem. It's a theorem of the conservation of power or the conservation of information content. This is a very general theorem, and, and the application to a Fourier transform is just uh, is just um, uh, one of the one of the examples. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, as I as I introduced before, f of k is the Fourier operator on an image i of r, um, and uh, 
Now the definition uh, of the power spectrum is that it's the absolute square of the Fourier transform. And um, and, the, and this theorem is that the total power uh, or the total information contents or the total variance is the same in the real or Fourier space. So, so this is conserved. Uh, so here is the <coughs> here's, here would be a way of computing. Uh, the variance in real space, um, uh, I of R minus the average all over the image, uh, <coughs> uh, absolute squared, and uh, integrated over the entire image. Okay, this is the variance. The same variance can be obtained by doing this in Fourier space, you take the <coughs> uh, Fourier transform absolute squared, uh, <coughs> integrate over the entire Fourier domain, but leave out the zero, the zero component. Uh, leaving out the zero component is equivalent to minus average. Okay, so it's the same thing. Yeah. Why do we have to square? Well, because uh, we, are, we, we are interested in the variance, yeah. So what it means is that the, the noise ratio is, um, is the ratio of uh, <coughs> the signal power integrated over the Fourier space, leaving out the zero, and uh, divided by the noise. Um, yeah, before, before going on, I just wonder uh, what, it, what it means is if you have, <coughs> if you have in a Fourier transform, you have the signal power in a certain bandwidth, okay, um, out to a certain resolution, and then nothing beyond. Then <coughs> the easiest way of of eliminating noise, um, you know, almost blindly, is to <coughs> take all the Fourier components away that are outside of the limit. Okay? Uh, it's very clear from this formula here that you, that you will boost the second to noise ratio uh, roughly by the ratio of these areas in Fourier space. Okay? No point spread function and contrast transfer function. <coughs> Um, I already showed you before how uh, the relationship uh, between the point that you want to average and this and this disk of, of least confusion, okay? Um, and uh, knowing, uh, I mean, to, using using Fourier transform, we can be more specific uh, about the relationship. <coughs> Um, we, we speak about uh, a point spread function. The meaning of the point spread function is that it is literally the, the, uh, the function that gives you the distribution of the, uh, uh, of the image of a single point in, uh, in, in the image plane. So instead of a point, uh, we get an extended image, and that's called the point spread function. It's a spread of the single point. <coughs> and the Fourier transform of the, of the point spread function is the contrast transfer function. 
Okay, so you've probably heard a lot of contrast transfer function, but you never thought about the point spread function. Well, they are Fourier pairs. Okay, um, so if you if you took a modular image processing system and took the contrast transfer function, actually mapped it out in two D, then Fourier transformed it, you would find a very see a very interesting uh, point. I'm going to show you examples of that. Um, now, in the transmission, the M, uh, the CDF, is given by an analytical expression. And I don't know whether you have already seen this. Um, it, uh, it's been made textbooks and so So, <coughs> contrast transfer function is the sign of gamma, <coughs> and gamma is the wave aberration function. This is it. This is the wave aberration function. <coughs> so there's a big deal here. Uh, let's talk about this one first. You can see that uh, <coughs> the, these variables here, uh, the k uh, is a spatial frequency. But it's not a component, but, but it's the absolute value of the component. Um, it's either squared or to the fourth power. So let's let's look at the term that comes in with a square. It is defocus plus uh, the astigmatic focus difference times sine two phi minus phi zero. Okay. So there is one term which is fixed here for a given defocus, and then there's another term that varies with the azimuth uh, wherever you, you are in the, in the image plane. So uh, when, when you use a microscope normally, then somebody, uh, somebody has already um, straightened out the instrument, has already corrected the astigmatism, so this entire term is zero. So then you are left with delta z times k squared. And you get another term here, which is another fixed term. Now this is fixed uh, no matter what, what, what focus you, you use. It is fixed with the instrument. The instrument has one spherical aberration constant. It's always the same. It's the, it's the <coughs> uh, sort of the if you will, the deformation of the objective lens, uh, they cannot be fixed. Um, and these are just, you know, the, the wavelength goes, goes in there. Um, <clears throat> so um, what's, what's interesting about this here is one term goes with, with minus, the other one with plus. The terms uh, counteract each other, and it's sort of a pretty unfair play because this goes with the fourth power, this goes with the, with the second power. So there's only one place where they're <coughs> sort of a little bit matched. Uh, there's sort of an interesting area where you have the wave aberration is uh, at least fairly constant in some kind of a range, and outside of the range, when you go up with the aperture, uh, <clears throat> this this term wins. Okay. The other thing, the interesting thing is is that if you go down to zero, then uh, you see that the CDF disappears, it goes to zero. So when we operate transmission microscope in bright field, then the phase contrast is expressed by this here. And we have to live with the fact that at low spatial frequencies, we have 
very little contrast, no matter what we do. Or what people do is uh, they make the, the focus very large, which has the effect that even at small k's, uh, we get sort of a, a very strong rise in the contrast. But it will never be uh, appreciable right next to uh, zero spatial frequency. OK, that comes a little late. I already told you that. Um, yeah, this, this is essentially sort of a replay of the image that I showed you before. Snow is, an, is a point spread function. Uh, <clears throat> oh, we are, we are going only to 5 o'clock. Wow. Yeah. And I didn't even have a biological break, right? <laughs> Does anybody need one? No? Uh, all right. Well, so so the presentation is much longer, and I'm going to um, make it available to everybody. Okay. Um, do you have an on our website for this? Or? Yes, on our website. Okay, great. Um, okay. So the, the point set function, which is the image of a single point, has a finite width. Uh, it's normally a very high maximum. And then there are side ripples. And depending, depending on the defocus, these side ripples can go very, very far. And sometimes you, you can see fringes along uh, the, the borders of an object. And these fringes are created by the Huygens principle. Because <clears throat> if you have an edge somewhere, an edge, and now you, uh, you think about the edge being presented by a series of point spread functions, you know, uh, right next to each other. Then all these side maxima fuse together to become a, um, a fringe that accompanies the edge. And you, you can see here we have not just one, but several of these here. So we have a number of fringes that accompany uh, the edge of an object. Yeah, so, so this is a point spread function uh, in which right here somewhere we have sort of an, an equal battle between the k, k square and the k4 term. Right? So we, they are sort of all mismatched. And then with higher k, all of a sudden the CS term, the k4, takes over and produces all these ripples. Here, we go to zero, and you know there's nothing. So uh, with this kind of contrast transfer function, you get, you get fairly good uh, transfer with, with the same polarity uh, between here and here. And beyond it, um, you, you, you can forget it. And so you can see that um, uh, there's a need for contrast transfer function correction. So what people do, what you do, uh, when you get uh, into the whole uh, <coughs> habit, um, you take images with different defocuses which means that this entire pattern is going to spread in different ways. It's like uh, as if you sort of pull it, pull it along here, <clears throat> and so that maxima and minima will come into different positions, and you get an overlap of all the information. <clears throat> um, so the energy spread. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about an, an, an actual physical microscope. Uh, it doesn't have one constant energy, but rather it has fluctuations. These kind of come from voltage changes, and they produce wavelength, wavelength changes. Um, and the, um, 
defocus changes have approximately the same effect as voltage changes. They can be expressed in the same way. So we, we get an envelope function due to energy spread or defocus spread. And this is uh, independent of defocus. When I say envelope, it means that, <clears throat> OK. This here is the ideal contrast transfer function, the ones that is stippled here. And then we always have the effect of an envelope. So it's like a damping uh, of this. And, the, and this envelope comes from energy spread and partial coherence. Obviously, it destroys the high uh, spatial <coughs> Uh, resolution. Okay, so uh, in approximation, it's, it's not an exact term, uh, an term, but in approximation, you can say that the contrast transfer function is the ideal contrast transfer function, the one that I wrote with, uh, out before, the sine gamma of k times an envelope the product with energy spread envelope and the angular spread envelope. Angular spread means illumination spread. So uh, <coughs> the ideal illumination would be uh, from the point source. And um, uh, when, when you have an uh, essentially a disk source, a spread source, then it means that, um, that the uh, illumination is no, longer, uh, is no longer parallel. Now, the, uh, I, I talked the defocus spread. Uh, <clears throat> defocus spread could be the result of uh, a lens current fluctuations. But there's another defocus spread which is intrinsic in the, in the whole sample because <coughs> the particle itself could be at different positions on the grid. And I told you before that maybe half the particles are, are down here and the half of the particles are, are up there. Then you get sort of an intrinsically a, a spread uh, in the information unless you keep track of where the particles are. But you can't, because you're, you're, you're imaging it uh, from a, you know, vertically. You, you don't know where the particle is. So here are examples of contrast transfer functions uh, in, in, the, in the completely uh, un modulated, uh, you know, unaffected case by, by envelopes and uh, in the case of partial coherence. Now, obviously, you, you know something about the power, uh, power spectrum that is expressed by the tone rings because the, <coughs> what, did, what did the tone rings tell us? Um, well, each of these here, either negative or positive, will show up as a ring. You cannot tell from the torn rings whether the contrast is transferred is uh, negative or positive. But you can count, OK? You, <coughs> we are starting off with, um, with, over fo uh, with under focus uh, and uh, with negative uh, focus which means that this first one here is negative transfer. Then comes positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on. We need to count exactly as you, as you go along here.
So the tone rings show how far the information is transmitted in Fourier space, and it also shows you whether we have this kind of anomaly with this second term in the k-square bracket or has an appreciable value. Then you get not a ring system, but an elliptical system. And that is, um, <coughs> that is no good. And you, you should be a discount images that show this kind of phenomenon. OK, well, um, the interesting thing is that <clears throat> we see the rings because we look at an object that has all Fourier components present. It is sort of an, uh, it, it's like an, a noise, uh, a, a noisy object. A noisy object are represented by a Fourier transform that has components all over the place. And you can you can think of of, of seeing such a such a noisy spectrum through some kind of a mask here, which which is which is the conscious transfer function. It, it, it now selectively enhances some part and uh, suppresses others. Suppresses here at the at the places where they are close to the zero. And incidentally, of course, it, it, it shows you how far out you, you go uh, in Fourier space. Uh, you can you can think of this here as the potential resolution. Why is it? Why do I call it potential resolution? Well, it's not the real resolution because if you use an image like this, um, you look at an image like this. It, it, it really has a resolution that corresponds to the first ring here. Everything else sort of cancels each other out. It's only after a correction of the uh, contrast transfer function, namely making the negative zones positive uh, and leaving the positive ones in place, then we can get all the information up to this potential resolution. But if we don't do CDF correction, we are stuck with an image with that resolution. <coughs> so I just have time to tell you about the convolution theorem and maybe about the correlation theorem. Um, that's sort of important. Um, <coughs> we have an, an object consisting of points. These are now discrete points. What happens if we now image these points with a microscope? It means that we replace each of the points by the point spread function. So we essentially see the same constellation as here, but everything is spread out. Now, this is called convolution. This is the operation of convolution. The convolution is very straightforward when the, when the points are discrete. But when, when you have an object in which you, you now have the task of finding out uh, for each point next to each other, we have to perform the same operation. Then all these things overlap, all right? And that's where the convolution product comes in. Here, this summation is very easy because they never overlap. OK, so in <coughs> one can write it out in this, in this way. <clears throat> so we have uh, O of R is an object, 
or an S is the signal resulting from EM energy. And H of I is the point spread function. And then we, we write, we write it out symbolically of signal equal to object convoluted with point spread function. And we call this whole thing a convolution product of O of R with H of R. So here I use this convolution symbol. And it stands for uh, <coughs> S of R is equal to O of R times H of R minus R prime integrated over all R primes. Okay? So this is exactly what I showed you before, except it's a continuous case. We consider every single point of this object and overlap it with a point spread function, place the point spread function uh, there, and then we integrate two dimensional integral over all these contributions. And you know, if we make the object, uh, if we make the instrument ideal, then it reproduces each part of the object, which means that uh, now formally we go through this object function convoluted with the point spread function, with this, which is ideal, the delta function, reproduces uh, the signal. The signal is identical with the object. Okay, this is the special case. And the correlation theorem looks very similar. Now the exciting thing is I showed you, I showed you this very um, complicated formula before to compute the correlation function. And this correlation theorem simplifies it with one stroke um, because there is a very elegant Fourier theorem which looks very similar to the convolution theorem. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so we have, let's say we have two noisy versions of a signal, <coughs> of a, yeah, S1 uh, plus, uh, S plus N1 and S, uh, well, S, wait a minute, yeah, and S2 equal to S R, R and N2. So these are different versions of this noise process. And then we use a different symbol here, uh, and <coughs> we call S1 correlated with S2, the correlation function of S1 with SR. And so what, what exactly is that? Uh, <coughs> and that stands for this. And you can see that uh, <coughs> with um, in comparison with what I showed you in the convolution integral, there's implicitly a plus here instead of a minus. And there's also a symmetry between these signals here. There's no, you know, there's, there's no special case for a point spread function. Um, <coughs> and um, so the correlation theorem uh, says the following. Um, the Fourier transform of the cross-correlation function is simply the product, the, the, the cross-product of the two um, Fourier transforms. Um, and the only difference with the correlation theorem is that uh, it's a conjugate product. product. I think I think I, I, I even left, left out the actual thing here. This here I left out before, I'm sorry. This is the actual theorem. Uh, <coughs> the theorem says uh, that in order to compute this complicated convolution product, 
you simply go into a Fourier space, and then uh, you simply take the product, the scalar product of the two functions, and then go back uh, into into real space. So in order to compute this here, all you have to do is go into Fourier space, form the product of the Fourier transforms, and then go back. And <coughs> and the only difference between the convolution theorem and the correlation theorem is that we now have uh, a different kind of product. It's no longer a straight scalar product, but a conjugate product. So this, this here, this theorem here has already uh, saved, uh, you know, <coughs> centuries of time, of computing time. <coughs> because it's being used all the time, all the time, okay? And it's very, very fast. It's a very elegant way of computing the correlation. <coughs> and that brings, brings me, yeah, I'll just have this a few minutes brings me to uh, what, I, what I showed you before, that the discrete Fourier transform is, is actually uh, a Fourier transform of an infinite repeat of the motif that you are uh, <coughs> transforming. So if you want to use discrete Fourier transform in order to do either, either convolution product or correlation uh, or the correlation function, we first have to pad. We have create we have create a space around it that avoids the overlap. Okay? Because now the discrete Fourier transform of this is, is an infinite array of this here placed next to each other. And when we shift it, we we no longer run into itself. Right? That's what a padding is is used for. You will see it everywhere. Oh, this kind of padding, right? And you know, this is just an example for a cross-correlation function. So I think I should just honor uh, your normal uh, lecture time. Uh, there are a number of things that I go into, where including the uh, <coughs> uh, 3D reconstruction. Uh, and classification, and uh, I hope you can uh, get the information from from the rest of the. Let let me just see where where I am here. I'm at 62, <coughs> and uh, it goes on. <laughs> right. Oh. Yeah, it's 132. Okay. <laughs> All right, <coughs> so we would be sitting here at 8 o'clock, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, well, thanks. And uh, you have questions, um, including questions you could uh, email me, okay? You're welcome to just send me something and I can refer you to something, okay? And, uh, but just read the, the rest of the lecture. It's, it's uh, at least as interesting as what I already talked to you about. Okay. The slides will be on your web page. I must thank Peter yeah. Frank one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you're free to talk to him afterwards. So it is even, it's now here. It's, it's, it's now here. here. So, right. so then okay. momentarily, by tomorrow, we'll have it on our website. Yeah, OK. Yeah.